Well, as I get to hear other people preach, now I hear occasionally people preach here, but uh, it, was, it was interesting to hear the different ones. One of them was my son. I have a son who's a pastor in, in the States, and uh, it, was, it was really a, a blessing to see how God is using him and, and the, the ability he has to, to preach. It's, um, when I was listening to one of them, I think it was in Sunday school, I can't even remember now, uh, they were looking at the book of Acts, and I thought, I, I could preach that. And uh, so I was preparing my message for this morning from Acts chapter 27, but I, I couldn't go past chapters 20 through 26. So that's, that's what we're going to look at. Chapter 27, 27 is about Paul's cruise. Did you know Paul went on a cruise? <laughs> but um, chapters 20 through 26, uh, the title for my message this morning is, How I Won a Mediterranean Holiday by Paul. <laughs> You'll, you'll see, I'm being a bit facetious, but um, chapter 27 really is about our, our hope that we have in, in Christ. In uh, chapters 20 through 26, we're going to look at our testimony. Uh, because of Paul's testimony, because of his relationship to the Lord, uh, his life was different. You know, when you trust Christ, really you're not, your life will never be the same. Uh, and in Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul is basically finishing his third missionary journey. And he wanted to be in Jerusalem. Uh, look in Acts chapter 20, verse 16. I'm, I'm kind of telling you a story this morning. Now, it's not my story. It's, it's Paul's story. But Acts chapter 20, verse 16, it says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. Down in verse 22, uh, he's talking to the elders of Ephesus. He called them and was, and was speaking to them. And he says, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was looking forward to going to Jerusalem, and he already knew that trouble awaited him. That pretty much was his, uh, his situation wherever he went. But it's interesting, as he went, more than once people said to Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 21, verse 4, uh, he's, he's in the, the city of Tyre. It says, in finding disciples, you know, anytime he went to a city, he tried to find other Christians. He says, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. You know, sometimes people are going to give you advice. And, uh, you know, that, who, who knows sometimes whether it's right or wrong. Some people think Paul was wrong to go to Jerusalem. Others, of course, I, I think he was, he was right. But, you know, sometimes it's just hard to know what's the next thing to do, isn't it? You know, the Bible doesn't tell you, and it's not right or wrong. It's just a decision you have to make. You've been through that. And uh, then when you make the decision, well, you just have to, to trust the Lord. So he arrives in Jerusalem, and basically he gives a missions report. There in chapter 21, verse 19, uh, they gather the church together. And uh, when he saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So he just tells them, this is what God did this, in this city and these people, and, and so on. He's given a, a testimony. And for whatever reason, then, they encourage him to join a Jewish ceremony, basically to show that he's not against the Old Testament. The, uh, the story had gone out that, oh, Paul, well, we'll look in, in chapter 21, verse 21. Um, it says, they're informed of thee. Okay, here's the story about you, Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Uh, so the story was going out. Oh, Paul, he's, he's against the Old Testament. And uh, so they encouraged him to join in this. I, I don't understand all that was involved, but he, there was other men that were doing it. There was a fee, and he, they asked him to pay the fee, and they would shave their heads. And anyway, it involved the temple and, and, and so on. And so he decides to do that. Verse 24 uh, them take and purify thyself with them and be at charge with them that they may shave their heads. I, I guess he paid for their haircuts. Uh, and all, that all may know that those things whereof they are informed concerning thee are nothing. So 
they're, they're encouraging him to join in this Jewish uh, ceremony. <coughs> what was, was Paul wrong to do that? Uh, some people think he was, some people think he wasn't. Again, sometimes it's hard to know sometimes what, uh, what to do. Paul just had to make a decision. So on the one hand, they're saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul ignores their advice, goes to Jerusalem. On the other hand, they're saying, you know, join in this ceremony, and Paul takes their advice and, and uh, participates. Now, you need to understand this is a week-long thing that he's involved in. And as a result of him taking their advice in this case, Paul is beaten and arrested. <laughs> in uh, chapter 21, verse 27, uh, so when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him, that's Paul, in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place. <laughs> you know, they, they said, this, this is a bad guy. And really, they just began to beat him up. Uh, in, uh, you, you know that from verse 32, when the soldiers come to break up the riot, it says, they left beating of Paul. That's not the soldiers, that's the people. Uh, that was a rough church to go to. I, uh, you know, I know we have our problems, but hopefully if you come here, you won't get beat up. Um, I hope. Um, and then the soldiers arrest him. Now, obviously, he's the troublemaker. Uh, verse 33, the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, not just one, two, and demanded who he was and what he'd done. <laughs> uh, so here's Paul. He takes their advice. He gets arrested. He gets beat up. And as you do, when you've been beaten and arrested, he asks if he can give his testimony. <laughs> that just boggles my mind. Here, here they're leading him away. Uh, let's see, where is it here? Verse 37. As Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Uh, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? He, they thought he, the soldiers thought he was an Egyptian. <laughs> they didn't even know he spoke Greek. Uh, Verse 39 says, No, I'm a man, a Jew of Tarsus. And uh, verse 40, when he'd given him license, he's, I'm sorry, he said uh, in, in verse 39, I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he'd given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hands, hand unto the people. And uh, when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. Isn't that amazing? Paul just took the opportunity, Here, here's a platform, here's some people, uh, here's some people to defend me, uh, can I talk to the crowd? Uh, you know, I think we need to take a lesson from that. We just need to take whatever opportunities we get uh, to speak up for the Lord. Paul gave his testimony, and, and we won't go through it in, in detail, we're going to look at another one in a moment, but he gives his background. He says, I'm just like you. I'm a Jew, and in verse 3 there, I am verily a man which am a Jew, Born in Tarsus, he talks about his training, how he grew up in the law. And verse 4, he says, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering unto prisons both men and, and, and women. The high priest doth bear me witness, and, and so on. He said, I used to persecute people who believe like me. <laughs> He's just giving them his, his background. And then he shares with them how God dealt with his rebellion. You know, how on the road to Damascus, you know, God said, Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And how he received Christ. Uh, in verse 10, uh, what shall I do, Lord? You know, he, he yielded himself to the Lord. He's just sharing this. Hey, can you picture the scene? Here's this crowd. He's on the steps, the soldiers, and, and they're listening to him. That's amazing. And then he shared to them how his life was changed. Uh, he, he's telling them how uh, Ananias had said to him, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. Verse 14, he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldst know his will and see that just one, that's talking about see Jesus, and shouldst hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. He said, God called me to, to take this message to people. Well, he comes down to the end of it, and he says how the Lord said to him in verse 21, I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And that, that got the crowd going again. Oh, Verse 22, they gave him audience under this word and then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. They didn't like that, that he would take God's message uh, to the Gentiles. And, you know, this is just an opportunity that Paul had. As, uh, you know, people had said, don't go to Jerusalem. 
Well, you know, earlier in, in Paul's life, God had said to them, said to him that he would, he would suffer for, for God's name's sake. And uh, this was just, just part of it. Uh, God had told him that he would share his message in Jerusalem and Rome. And Paul was willing, willing to do that. Well, he's then taken from there to the Jewish council. It, it was a strange time in Israel then politically. They were overall ruled by Rome. But they also had their own government. Uh, they had the Sanhedrin, uh, 71 people, including the high priest. It was kind of the Jewish Senate. And they were the Jewish rulers that were underneath the Roman rulers. So he's taken to, the, to them. And he tries to give his testimony there. I don't know if you know the story, but the high priest says, strike him on the mouth. They're going to say slap him. And basically, and somebody just, pow, hits him in the head. And it, it makes him angry. Paul was not above getting angry. And then he cries out, I'm just here because of the resurrection. <laughs> he knew that part of them believed in the resurrection and part didn't. And they got so excited, it was like they were having a riot. In verse 10 of chapter 23, when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be, have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And so here he is with the council, and they're going nuts. And uh, the soldiers are there, and they, they have to rescue him from the Senate. You've probably seen things in the news where in some countries they'll have fist fights in, in the government and so on. That's kind of the way these guys were. And uh, so Paul is, is rescued, and there's a plot afoot. The Jewish council is going to ask for Paul to be brought back, so that theory, theoretically that they could question him. But they, they had worked out that if he came a second time, they'd have men posted who'd kill him on the way. Well, the, the Romans found out about that, and so they send him to their leader. They send him to their governor. In uh, chapter 24 and verse 1, uh, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. And so uh, the Jews lay out their charges against Paul uh, before the governor. And Paul gives his testimony. Basically, the next part, he gives not only his testimony, but his defense. In verse 14, This I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And so he, he begins to talk to the, to the Roman council and, and to the governor about his testimony. Well, later on, uh, the governor's name is Felix. Uh, Felix questions him privately. Down in, in verse 24 of chapter 24. After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So Felix talks to him privately. He, listen to this, verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. He had an emotional response to what Paul was saying and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. How many people have done that? Oh, someday I'll trust the Lord. And the next verse says he, he hoped to actually get money from Paul. Uh, so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't com completely overwrought. Uh, but Felix questions him, him privately. And then Paul is held as a prisoner for two years. Two years. Verse 27. After two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room. Uh, they had a new governor. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So Felix just leaves him in prison. Now there's a new governor named Festus. And uh, Festus takes over, and, and the Jews renew their charges. In chapter 25, when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him. One of the first things they do with this new governor. We've got this guy in prison. We want you to charge him. He desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. They still had the same plan. <laughs> they hadn't changed. If he'll bring him, we'll kill him. That was their, their plot. Um, well, at this point, look at verse 9 there. Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? So he was, he was willing to 
to bring Paul to Jerusalem. Verse 10, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to, be, uh, refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So at this point, Paul takes the option that every Roman citizen had. He appealed to Caesar. Verse 12, Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. So this was, this was Paul's uh, preparation for his, uh, uh, his trip to Rome. And uh, do you notice a, a pattern here? Paul, whenever he's confronted with this, he, he shares his testimony. And, and even at this time, as he asks to be taken to Rome for judgment, uh, Festus allows the Jewish king, King Agrippa, Herod, to interview him. Uh, chapter 25, verse 22 then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. So while he's waiting to be shipped to Rome, uh, Herod interviews him. And uh, down in, uh, uh, in verse, uh, let's see here. Well, we're going to look at his testimony in just a minute. But you know, Paul took every opportunity. When there was a hostile crowd, can I speak to the crowd? <laughs> when there's a, uh, you know, the, the religious uh, uh, council, L let me share my testimony with you. You didn't get the chance to. Uh, when it's uh, political rulers, uh, let me tell you, you know, why I'm here. And, and he shares Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul didn't just use Jesus. Paul served Jesus. You know, when he was in trouble, uh, he didn't say, oh, you know, why would the Lord do this to me? He saw it as an opportunity. Here's a group of people I wouldn't normally get to talk to. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, you know, what God has done for me. And you know, that's, uh, that's such an important thing when we understand Christianity. Christianity is not just God making your life easier or uh, doing something for you to, to make life the way you think it ought to be. When you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, you're saying, you're the Lord. You can use me. I'll, I'll be your servant. And you know, you, you need to ask yourself that question. What about you? Are you just using the Lord or are you willing to serve the Lord? It's so important. You know, God calls us from our culture to His culture, from the world's kingdom to His kingdom. It makes a difference who's king in your life. And for Paul, as he was on his life's journey, God took him from place to place, and, and he knew that, that trouble waited wherever he went when he shared the gospel. Because he started with the Jews. And boy, they didn't all want to hear it, but some, when they heard it, got saved. And what a blessing it is to see the, the example that we, we, we see here in, in Paul. You know, back in, in Acts chapter 9 and, and verses 15 and 16, Ananias had said, He's a chosen vessel unto me, that's Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then later on in chapter 23, verse 11, The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. As thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. You stop and think about that statement. The way he'd borne witness in Jerusalem was that he was beat up and arrested and, and mocked. <laughs> oh boy, I get to do the same thing in Rome. <laughs> it's, he's saying to him, Paul, you've won a cruise. <laughs> Here, we're sending you to Rome, and you get to do it all over again there. Uh, Paul was willing to serve the Lord. And, and the, the main thing I want us to look at this morning is Paul's testimony before King Agrippa. Uh, look with me there in, in Acts chapter 26. Uh, Paul gets the opportunity to share the gospel with the Jewish king. Now, the Jewish king, uh, probably a little bit like England's king or queen, not really a lot of power. Uh, you know, more symbolic than, than anything else, but an important person. And, and a man who understood Scripture and, and, you know, knew about Jewish things. Paul says, first of all, in Acts 26, verse 2, I think myself self happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews, especially 
because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now, he's not flattering King Agrippa. It's just the truth. Here was a man who understood uh, where he was coming from. And, and I think there's five phrases here that summarize the life of Paul and, and his testimony. Let me read verses 4 and, and 5. It says, My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. He said, My life's an open book. People know where I come from. Which knew me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. The first phrase is this, I lived a Pharisee. Now that meant something. I was trying to think of a modern day example. Maybe if someone said, I'm a teacher. Well, you would know. They had to go to school. They had to study. They, they do certain things. You know, they go to a, a school and they have students and so on. Well, there was just when Paul said, I lived a Pharisee, they knew exactly what that meant. What training he'd had how he had to live, and so on. That was his past. That was his history. We all have a history. And when you become a Christian, there has to be something before. All right? Now, I've talked to people and say, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I've always been a Christian. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, you, nobody has always been a Christian except Christ. <laughs> he is the Christ. There has to be a before. And uh, he talks... Uh, Later on about his commitment to Scripture and to prophecy. You know, even as a non-Christian, he was committed to Scripture. He just didn't understand that the Christ had come. Now, verse 6, he says, I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? He said, it's not hard for God. He had a, a commitment to Scripture. And he, he talks then about his, in his past, he persecuted and pursued Christians. Look at verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Paul was committed, before he was saved, to persecuting Christians. And you need to understand, uh, that's the way he lived. When he lived, he was, man, he was all in or all out, you know. He wasn't half-hearted about anything. And before he was saved, uh, he was a Pharisee. I lived a Pharisee. But then something changed. The second phrase, verse... Uh, verse 12 and 13, Whereof, Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. The second phrase is, I saw light. Uh, he begins to talk about his conversion. Now let me, let me say this, Paul's conversion is unique. You don't have to see a light from heaven to get saved. Amen. All right? And then he, he says, uh, verse 14, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The third thing is, I heard a voice. He's talking here about his conversion. Now, if you're saved, at some point, something happened, and you trusted Christ. Now, it might have happened in a church service. It might have happened at home. It might have happened at camp. Uh, it could have happened in prison. or you know, uh, There could be all kinds of physical things that were going on when you got saved that God used, and He used the Scriptures, and He used the Holy Spirit, and, and that's when you got saved. Um, he heard a voice. You know, God's Word convicts. Uh, today, we don't have to hear God's voice from heaven. He wrote it down. And that's, that's what people need to hear in, in order to get saved. Uh, his conversion is, is an amazing thing. He heard a voice, and, and God spoke, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus. You know, to get saved, you have to meet Jesus. And at that point, God gives his commission. God didn't just, you know, we don't just get saved to go to heaven. We get saved to serve the Lord. Verse 16 there, he says, I am Jesus, verse 15, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, 
delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I, now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith which is in me. You know, at his conversion, God says, Paul, I'm, I'm saving you to serve me. You know the same is true for all of us? Uh, Paul lived a Pharisee. That was his past. But then he saw light and he heard a voice. And he, he trusted Jesus Christ. Lord, he said, uh, who, who art thou? Lord, what would thou have me to do? He called upon Jesus as Lord. And then verse 19, here's the next one. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now, the fourth thing is, I was not disobedient. Let me read on. But showed first unto them of Damascus. You know, right away he began to witness. And at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea. And then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and, and went about to kill me. You know, Paul was not disobedient. That's kind of a negative way to put it, isn't it? But it's good. What it's saying is he was willing to obey the Lord. He was happy to get saved, and then he was willing to obey. You know, obedience is a mark of conversion. Uh, there's a lot of people who say that they're saved who really have, don't seem to have any relationship with the Lord. In uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, he says, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. You know, there's, there's at least a heart uh, to try and obey the Lord. There's at least a sorrow when we don't. <laughs> uh, Paul was, was not disobedience. Uh, obedience is a recognition of authority. You know, when somebody tells you to do something and they have no authority over you, you just ignore them, don't you? <laughs> do this, do that. Uh, it's like your brother or sister, you know, do this. But when they say, Mom says you're to do this, well, there's some authority there, isn't there? And with the Christian life, in, in, in Acts 5, 29, uh, they said to the Jewish leaders, we ought to obey God rather than men. You, you know, they didn't have to do what men said. They did have to do what God said. And as Christians... Uh, you know, we need to be like Paul, not, not disobedience. The Bible says obedience is a proof of love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments in John chapter 14. You know, let me ask you this morning, have you seen the light? <laughs> not a light, but have you seen the light? Have you heard God's word? Well, then your response need to be, don't be disobedient. You know, when God says you need to repent and, and believe the Lord Jesus, don't put it off. Uh, don't ignore it. Obey him. Do what God says. You know, there was Felix and Agrippa. You know, they disobeyed the Lord. Oh, maybe another time. Paul obeyed. He trusted Christ. Within the last phrase in verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Uh, Paul's last phrase there that I'm, I'm using is, I continue unto this day. You know, when you, when you trust Christ as Savior, it's not just a momentary thing. It's something that continues. God calls it eternal life, and he's, His promise is He'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, we might have ups and downs. Uh, we might get away from the Lord. You know, we talk about being backslidden and carnal and different things like that. But God won't leave us alone. Uh, you know, I've heard of folks who, who've tried to abandon the Lord. But if you're saved, you just can't do it. I've told you this before. I have a friend who, he, he just decided he'd had enough. So he bought some cigarettes and he went down to the tavern and ordered a beer. And, and he thought, this is stupid. And he walked out and <laughs> never went back again. <laughs> he's, he's a preacher now. <laughs> you know, uh, God just won't leave you alone. And it's an amazing thing. He said, I continue unto this day. Faithfulness is an evidence of, of true salvation. It's like he says in Galatians, let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season ye shall reap. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, you find that here. He says, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. That's Christianity. It's patiently running the race, continuing, continuing with the Lord. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter 1 and, and verse 13, 
He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that's brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You're just continuing, uh, just uh, bearing with the things of life. Uh, he says, let us not be weary in well-doing. You have to work at faithfulness. We've all experienced physically times when we knew there was something we had to do. Uh, I can remember laying down in bed and, and then you hear water running. Oh, I left the water running. Now, if you're a faithful person, you get up and turn it off, don't you? <laughs> uh, or you, you think, oh, I left the car unlocked or, you know, whatever it is. You get up and do it. And, and that's the same with spiritual things. Because you're faithful, you get up and do it. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't always come to church because I want to. I come, I come to church because I want to be faithful because I love the Lord. You've heard the silly old joke where, you know, the, the guy is talking to his wife and he, he says, you know, I'm not going to church today. Nobody down there likes me, and I don't like any of them, and it, it's just, I'm just, I don't want to go. She said, well, you will go. You're the pastor. <laughs> I hope that's not true of anybody I know, but, uh, you know, we, we just want to be faithful, don't we? We want to continue and do what God says. Uh, Paul had a testimony. That, that's the thing I wanted to get across this morning. Paul had a testimony. He knew he'd been lost. That's so important. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there has been a time in your life when you've been lost? Because let me say, if you've never been lost, you've never been saved. It's not enough just to, you know, some people grow up in, in Christianity. Well, even if you're in a Christian home and go to church from the time you're, you're young, there still has to come a time when you see yourself as a sinner. Uh, Doyle has a younger brother. He's 12 years younger than her. And when he was a young boy, uh, his dad was the pastor, and he, uh, I remember hearing the testimony, just as a kid, you know, I don't remember how old, maybe seven years old, he came up and at the invitation, and he told his dad, he said, yeah, I'm a poor lost sinner, and I need to be saved. And you know, it's true, it doesn't matter how old you are or what you've done, we're all sinners, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, he knew he'd been lost, he knew he needed to be saved. In, in Romans 5.12, he says, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He doesn't say death passed upon everybody but you. <laughs> he says all. Oh, we all need to be saved. And Paul knew he'd been lost. He knew God spoke to him. You know, that's important. Uh, have you heard from God? God speaks to us today through the Bible and through the Holy Spirit. Do you remember God dealing with your sin? Listen, if you're saved... Uh, Quite often, there's just a time when there's a struggle. You know, God is convicting us, keeps poking us. You know, what about that? What about that? What about that? And it's a difficult time in our life. The Bible says all of sin. He says the wages of sin is death. Uh, Paul knew that God was speaking to him. And then Paul knew that he'd been saved. Do you? Do you have assurance of salvation? Has there been a time when you've recognized yourself as a sinner? Recognize Jesus as the Savior and called upon Him to, to save you? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, salvation is so simple. Uh, the world tries to make it hard. Often they want your money. You know, it's like a, that guy dealing with Paul, hoping that Paul would give him money. A lot of the religions are like that. But listen, salvation is free because Christ paid for it. And we meet together as uh, people set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. What a, what a blessing it is to, to know that you've been saved. Paul knew a time and a place. He understood that there had been a time before, there had been a time as God dealt with him, and man, he responded. I was not disobedient. And then Paul knew that he was saved to serve. Do you understand that? Salvation is not just a ticket to heaven. Salvation is a relationship. It's God walking with you, and you walking with God. Life-changing. How has Christ changed your life? Listen, it'll change. Uh, there's people who, when they get saved, their very family turns against them. Some people are killed because they trust Christ. And they think they're doing the world a favor. Listen, we need to know the truth and be set free by the truth of, of God and His Word. How has Christ changed your life? I guess what my question is this morning, what's your testimony? What's your before? Uh, mine is, I was a kid growing up in church. But I realized that I needed to be saved. And my uh, salvation testimony is that I have a real church background. Uh, 
my parents, I don't remember, ever remember a time when we didn't go to church. And the pastor of our church was my dad's brother. And the visiting preacher was my dad's other brother. <laughs> so I mean, we had a lot of church. <laughs> but I, as a person, I couldn't come before God as my dad's son. I had to come before God as myself. God doesn't have any grandchildren. God doesn't have any nieces or nephews. God has children. And I had to trust Christ. And when I heard the, the preaching that particular time was when, when I responded. I can still kind of picture the building. I remember going back there as an adult, and it was a lot smaller than I thought. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there has to be a time when you trust Christ. And then there needs to be a change. You know, I can remember times in my life when I, I'd think, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, listen, I didn't grow up wanting to talk to groups of people. I was happy to be just me, you know, not, not worrying about others. But God called me to preach. I thought, he, 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 must, he must be pointing at somebody else. You know? uh, but I've been willing to make the change. You know, there's things God will... It's exciting serving the Lord. He'll ask you to do things you never thought you'd do. And uh, what a blessing it is. How has Christ changed your life? Uh, you need to have a testimony. You know, as Christians, we ought all be able to speak for Christ. Now, some are going to do it more fluently than others, and... Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of differences that we'll have. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. We need to be able to speak for Christ. We need to have a testimony. We ought always to live for Christ. You know, Paul was able to say, I continue. Now, he didn't just start, he, he continued. And you're not going to be able to predict people's responses. You know, as you talk to them about Christ, sometimes the most unlikely people will listen to you. Sometimes the people you think, oh, they'd make a good church member, won't even listen to you. They think they're good enough. Uh, you know, Felix, the, the governor, he responded very emotionally. He, he trembled. Uh, Festus, I, I didn't read the verse. Let me read it. Uh, Acts 26, uh, verse 26, I think it is. Felix, uh, Festus is the one who... who allowed Paul to talk to King Agrippa. Well, he was there. And in uh, verse uh, 24, it is, of chapter 26, uh, as he thus spake for himself, in Paul, Festus said with a loud voice, so he shouted, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. He said, you're crazy, Paul, <laughs> all these things you're sharing. Paul said, I'm not mad, Festus. I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The king knoweth these things before whom I speak freely. Yeah, you, you just never know how people are going to respond. Uh, some are going to get angry. Uh, Agrippa was very skeptical. Um, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, he said to Paul. Man, Paul said, I, I wish you not only almost, but altogether were just like me, except for my bonds. <laughs> you know, as you share Christ with folks, some will, 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 will believe you. Not all will. Not everyone believed Jesus. And those who believe will thank you for sharing the message. And what a blessing that is. Our job is just to be faithful and, and proclaim the word. Start by knowing that you yourself are saved. Having a testimony. What you were before. How you got saved. How God is changing your, your life. You know, uh, there's such, such hope in the Lord Jesus. Such blessing. Uh, we, are, we are a blessed people. And... Uh, not only know you're saved, but live for Jesus. Be obedient and continue. We're looking someday for God's well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, you'll have ups and downs. Uh, you'll have difficulties with some Christians and blessings from some Christians, and uh, they'll have the same from you. But listen, we need to be faithful as individuals, and uh, God can use us. We can work together, and uh, God can, can help us as a church to grow. But you know, it starts with you as an individual, me as an individual. I need to have that proper relationship with the Lord. You know, maybe today there's, uh, some of you don't know whether you're saved or not. Well, God can help you through His Word. Uh, we can point you to places. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. See, it's not just something that comes from within you. It's something that comes from God's Word. It's you trusting God. And uh, you can know that you're saved. God says, these are written that you may know that you have eternal life. It's based on God's Word. It's when we trust God's Word that we know we're saved. Listen, you won't know you're saved by trusting your feelings. You won't know you're saved by trusting your actions. 
You'll know you're saved when you believe what God has said and done and your faith is in His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, if that's your need this morning, listen, God can help you there. If your problem is a sin problem, that's good. God has a solution. Maybe you're saved and, and, and you're not continuing like you should. God can help you there too. He's faithful. He, he won't forsake you. He'll work with you. He'll forgive you and, and help you. Um, the Bible says that the very first step of obedience for a Christian is baptism. Uh, some of you need to be scripturally baptized. Uh, you know, first you get saved, then you get baptized, and then you continue. Let me encourage you to, to, to do that. We're going to sing a song of invitation this morning. It's uh, the song, uh, Have You Any Room for Jesus? It's page 505 in the, in the song book there. I'm sure they'll have it up on the screen here. And as we sing, let me encourage you to respond to the Lord. You know, you, you won't see a light from heaven. You won't hear a voice from heaven. But you've heard God's word faithfully and clearly and simply presented this morning. And uh, you can respond to the Lord as, as he would have you to.